worth repeating, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Apple's ability to design such innovative products so consistently and their ability to command such astounding loyalty for their products comes from more than simply what they do. The problem is, organizations use the tangible features and benefits to build a rational argument for why their company, product or idea is better than another. Sometimes those comparisons are made outright and sometimes analogies or metaphors are drawn, but the effect is the same. Companies try to sell us what they do, but we buy why they do it. This is what I mean when one say they communicate from the outside in, they lead with what and how. When communicating from the inside out, however, the why is offered as the reason to buy and the what's serve as the tangible proof of that belief. The things we can point to rationalize or explain the reasons we're drawn to one product, company or idea over another. What companies do are external factors, but why they do it is something deeper. In practical terms, there is nothing special about Apple. It is just a company like any other. There is no real difference between Apple and any of its competitors, Dell, HP, Gateway, Toshiba. Pick one, it doesn't matter. They are all corporate structures. That's all a company is. It's a structure. They all make computers. They all have some systems that work and some that don't. They all have equal access to the same talent, the same resources, the same agencies, the same consultants and the same media. They all have some good managers, some good designers and smart engineers. They all make some products that work well and some that don't. Even Apple. Why, then, does Apple have such a disproportionate level of success? Why are they more innovative? Why are they consistently more profitable? And how did they manage to build such a cultish loyal following? something very few companies are ever able to achieve. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. This is the reason Apple has earned a remarkable level of flexibility. People are obviously comfortable buying a computer from Apple. But people are also perfectly comfortable buying an MP3 player from them, or a cell phone or a DVR. Consumers and investors are completely at ease with Apple offering so many different products in so many different categories. It's not what Apple does that distinguishes them. It is why they do it. Their products give life to their cause. I'm not so foolhardy as to propose that their products don't matter, of course they do. But it's the reason they matter that is contrary to the conventional wisdom. Their products, unto themselves, are not the reason Apple is perceived as superior, their products, what Apple makes, serve as the tangible proof of what they believe. It is that clear correlation between what they do and why they do it that makes Apple stand out. This is the reason we perceive Apple as being authentic. Everything they do works to demonstrate their why, to challenge the status quo. Regardless of the products they make or industry in which they operate, it is always clear that Apple thinks different. When Apple first came out with the Macintosh, Having an operating system based on a graphical user interface and not a complicated computer language challenged how computers worked at the time. What's more, where most technology companies saw their biggest marketing opportunity among businesses, Apple wanted to give an individual sitting at home the same power as any company. Apple's why, to challenge the status quo and to empower the individual, is a pattern in that it repeats in all they say and do. It comes to life in their iPod and even more so in iTunes, a service that challenged the status quo of the music industry's distribution model and was better suited to how individuals consumed music. The music industry was organized to sell albums, a model that evolved during a time when listening to music was largely an activity we did at home. Sony changed that in 1979 with the introduction of the Walkman. But even the Walkman, and later the Discman, was limited to the number of cassette tapes or CDs you could carry in addition to the device. The development of the MP3 music format changed all that. Digital compression allowed for a very high quantity of songs to be stored on relatively inexpensive and highly portable digital music devices. 
Our ability to walk out of the house with only one easy-to-carry device transformed music into something we largely listened to away from home. And the MP3 not only changed where we listened to music, it also transformed us from an album-collecting culture to a song-collecting culture. While the music industry was still busy trying to sell us albums, a model that no longer suited consumer behavior, Apple introduced their iPod by offering us 1,000 songs in your pocket. With the iPod and iTunes, Apple did a much better job of communicating the value of both the MP3 and the MP3 player relative to how we lived our lives. Their advertising didn't offer exhaustive descriptions of product details, it wasn't about them, it was about us. And we understood why we wanted it. Apple did not invent the MP3, nor did they invent the technology that became the iPod, yet they are credited with transforming the music industry with it. The multi-gigabyte portable hard drive music player was actually invented by Creative Technology Limited, a Singapore-based technology company that rose to prominence by making the Sound Blaster audio technology that enables home pieces to have sound. In fact, Apple didn't introduce the iPod until 22 months after Creative's entry into the market. This detail alone calls into question the assumption of a first mover's advantage. Given their history in digital sound, Creative was more qualified than Apple to introduce a digital music product. The problem was, they advertised their product as a 5GB MP3 player. It is exactly the same message as Apple's 1000 songs in your pocket. The difference is Creative told us what their product was and Apple told us why we needed it. Only later, once we decided we had to have an iPod, did the what matter, and we chose the 5GB version, 10GB version, and so on, the tangible details that proved we could get the 1000 songs in our pocket. Our decision started with why, and so did Apple's offering. How many of us can say with certainty that, indeed, an iPod is actually better than Creative's Zen? iPods, for example, are still plagued with battery life and battery replacement issues. They tend to just die. Maybe a Zen is better. The reality is, we don't even care if it is. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And it is Apple's clarity of why that gives them such a remarkable ability to innovate, often competing against companies seemingly more qualified than they, and succeed in industries outside their core business. The same cannot be said for companies with a foos to why sense of why. When an organization defines itself by what it does, that's all it will ever be able to do. Apple's competitors, having defined themselves by their products or services, regardless of their differentiating value proposition, are not afforded the same freedom. Gateway, for example, started selling flat-screen TVs in 2003. Having made flat-screen monitors for years, they were every bit as qualified to make and sell TVs. But the company failed to make a credible name for itself among consumer electronics brands and gave up the business two years later to focus on its core business. Dell came out with PTAs in 2002 and MP3 players in 2003, but lasted only a few years in each market. Dell makes good quality products and is fully qualified to produce these other technologies. The problem was they had defined themselves by what they did. They made computers, and it simply didn't make sense to us to buy a PDA or MP3 player from them. It didn't feel right. How many people do you think would stand online for six hours to buy a new cell phone from Dell, as they did for the release of Apple's iPhone? People couldn't see Dell as anything more than a computer company. It just didn't make sense. Poor sales quickly ended Dell's desire to enter the small electronic goods market, instead they opted to focus on their core business. Unless Dell, like so many others, can rediscover their founding purpose, cause or belief and start with why in all they say and do, all they will ever do is sell computers. They will be stuck in their core business. Apple, unlike its competitors, has defined itself by why it does things, not what it does. It is not a computer company, but a company that challenges the status quo and offers individuals simpler alternatives.
Apple even changed its legal name in 2007 from Apple Computer Incorporated to Apple Incorporated to reflect the fact that they were more than just a computer company. Practically speaking, it doesn't really matter what a company's legal name is. For Apple, however, having the word computer in their name didn't limit what they could do. It limited how they thought of themselves. The change wasn't practical, it was philosophical. Apple's Y was formed at its founding in the late 1970s and hasn't changed to this date. Regardless of the products they make or the industries into which they migrate, their Y still remains a constant. And Apple's intention to challenge accepted thinking has proved prophetic. As a computer company they redirected the course of the personal computing industry. As a small electronics company they have challenged the traditional dominance of companies like Sony and Philips. As a purveyor of mobile phones they pushed the old hands, Motorola, Ericsson, and Nokia, to re-examine their own businesses. Apple's ability to enter and even dominate so many different industries has even challenged what it means to be a computer company in the first place. Regardless of what it does, we know why Apple exists. The same cannot be said for their competitors. Although they all had a clear sense of why at some point, it was one of the primary factors that helped each of them become billion dollar companies, over the course of time, all of Apple's competitors lost their why. Now all those companies define themselves by what they do, we make computers. They turned from companies with a cause into companies that sold products. And when that happens, price, quality, service and features become the primary currency to motivate a purchase decision. At that point a company and its products have ostensibly become commodities. As any company forced to compete on price, quality, service or features alone can attest, it is very hard to differentiate for any period of time or build loyalty on those factors alone. Plus it costs money and is stressful waking up every day trying to compete on that level alone. Knowing why is essential for lasting success and the ability to avoid being lumped in with others. Any company faced with the challenge of how to differentiate themselves in their market is basically a commodity, regardless of what they do or how they do it. Ask a milk producer, for example, and they will tell you that there are actually variations among milk brands. The problem is you have to be an expert to understand the differences. To the outside world, all milk is basically the same, so we just lump all the brands together and call it a commodity. In response, that's how the industry acts. This is largely the pattern for almost every other product or service on the market today, business to consumer or business to business. They focus on what they do and how they do it without consideration of why, we lump them together and they act like commodities. The more we treat them like commodities, the more they focus on what and how they do it. It's a vicious cycle. But only companies that act like commodities are the ones who wake up every day with the challenge of how to differentiate. Companies and organizations with a clear sense of why never worry about it. They don't think of themselves as being like anyone else and they don't have to convince anyone of their value. They don't need complex systems of carrots and sticks. They are different, and everyone knows it. They start with why in everything they say and do. There are those who still believe that Apple's difference comes from its marketing ability. Apple sells a lifestyle, marketing professionals will tell you. Then how come these marketing professionals haven't intentionally repeated Apple's success and longevity for another company? Calling it a lifestyle is a recognition that people who live a certain way choose to incorporate Apple into their lives. Apple didn't invent the lifestyle, nor does it sell a lifestyle. Apple is simply one of the brands that those who live a certain lifestyle are drawn to those people use certain products or brands in the course of living in that lifestyle, that is, in part, how we recognize their way of life in the first place. The products they choose become proof of why they do the things they do. It is only because Apple's why is so clear that those who believe what they believe are drawn to them. As Harley Davidson fits into the lifestyle of a certain group of people and Prada shoes fit the lifestyle of another group, it is the lifestyle that came first. 
like the products the company produces that serve as proof of the company's why, so too does a brand or product serve as proof of an individual's why. Others, even some who work for Apple, will say that what truly distinguishes Apple is in fact the quality of their products alone. Having good quality products is of course important. No matter how clear your why, if what you sell doesn't work, the whole thing falls flat. But a company doesn't need to have the best products, they just need to be good or very good. Better or best is a relative comparison. Without first understanding why, the comparison itself is of no value to the decision maker. The concept of better begs the question, based on what standard? Is a Ferrari F430 sports car better than a Honda Odyssey minivan? It depends why you need the car. If you have a family of six, a two-seater Ferrari is not better. However, if you're looking for a great way to meet women, a Honda minivan is probably not better, depending on what kind of woman you're looking to meet, I guess, I too shouldn't make assumptions. Why the product exists must first be considered and why someone wants it must match. I could tell you about all the engineering marvels of the Honda Odyssey, some of which may actually be better than a Ferrari. It certainly gets better gas mileage. The odds are that I'm not going to convince someone who really wants that sports car to buy anything else. That some people are viscerally drawn to a Ferrari more than a Honda Odyssey says more about the person than the engineering of the product. The engineering, for example, would simply be one of the tangible points that a Ferrari lover could point out to prove how he feels about the car. The dogged defense of the superiority of the Ferrari from the person whose personality is predisposed to favor all the features and benefits of a Ferrari cannot be an objective conversation, Ferrari. Why do you think most people who buy Ferraris are willing to pay a premium to get it in red whereas most who buy Honda Odysseys probably don't care much about the color at all? For all those who will try to convince you that Apple computers are just better, I cannot dispute a single claim. All I can offer is that most of the factors that they believe make them better meet their standard of what a computer should do. With that in mind, Macintoshes are, in practice, only better for those who believe what Apple believes. Those people who share Apple's why believe that Apple's products are objectively better, and any attempt to convince them otherwise is pointless. Even with objective metrics in hand, the argument about which is better or which is worse without first establishing a common standard creates nothing more than debate. Loyalists for each brand will point to various features and benefits that matter to them, or don't matter to them, in an attempt to convince the other that they are right. And that's one of the primary reasons why so many companies feel the need to differentiate in the first place, based on the flawed assumption that only one group can be right. But what if both parties were right? What if an Apple was right for some people and a PC was right for others? It's not a debate about better or worse anymore, it's a discussion about different needs. And before the discussion can even happen, the whys for each must be established first. A simple claim of better, even with the rational evidence to back it up, can create desire and even motivate a decision to buy, but it doesn't create loyalty. If a customer feels inspired to buy a product, rather than manipulated, they will be able to verbalize the reasons why they think what they bought is better. Good quality and features matter, but they are not enough to produce the dogged loyalty that all the most inspiring leaders and companies are able to command. It is the cause that is represented by the company, brand, product or person that inspires loyalty. Not the only way, just one way knowing your why is not the only way to be successful, but it is the only way to maintain a lasting success and have a greater blend of innovation and flexibility. When a why goes fuzzy, it becomes much more difficult to maintain the growth, loyalty and inspiration that helped drive the original success. By difficult, I mean that manipulation rather than inspiration fast becomes the strategy of choice to motivate behavior. This is effective in the short term but comes at a high cost in the long term. Consider the classic business school case of the railroads. In the late 1800s, the railroads were the biggest companies in the country. Having achieved such monumental success, even changing the landscape of America, 
remembering why stopped being important to them. Instead they became obsessed with what they did, they were in the railroad business. This narrowing of perspective influenced their decision making, they invested all their money in tracks and cross ties and engines. But at the beginning of the 20th century, a new technology was introduced, the airplane. And all those big railroad companies eventually went out of business. What if they had defined themselves as being in the mass transportation business? Perhaps their behavior would have been different. Perhaps they would have seen opportunities that they otherwise missed. Perhaps they would own all the airlines today. The comparison raises the question of the long-term survivability of so many other companies that have defined themselves and their industries by what they do. They have been doing it the same way for so long that their ability to compete against a new technology or see a new perspective becomes a daunting task. The story of the railroads has eerie similarities to the case of the music industry discussed earlier. This is another industry that has not done a good job of adjusting its business model to fit a behavioral change prompted by a new technology. But other industries whose business models evolved in a different time show similar cracks, the newspaper, publishing and television industries, to name but three. These are the current-day railroads that are struggling to define their value while watching their customers turn to companies from other industries to serve their needs. Perhaps if music companies had a clearer sense of why, they would have seen the opportunity to invent the equivalent of iTunes instead of leaving it to a scrappy computer company. In all cases, going back to the original purpose, cause or belief will help these industries adapt. Instead of asking, what should we do to compete? The questions must be asked, why did we start doing what we are doing in the first place, and what can we do to bring our cause to life considering all the technologies and market opportunities available today? But don't take my word for it. None of this is my opinion. It is all firmly grounded in the tenets of biology. This is not opinion, this is biology now, the star belly sneeches had bellies with stars. The plain belly sneeches had none upon thus. Those stars weren't so big. They were really so small. You might think such a thing wouldn't matter at all. Then, quickly, Sylvester McMonkey had been put together a very peculiar machine. And he said, You want stars like a star belly sneech? My friends, you can have them for $3 each. In his 1961 story about the sneeches, Dr. Seuss introduced us to two groups of sneeches, one with stars on their bellies and the other with none. The ones without stars wanted desperately to get stars so they could feel like they fit in. They were willing to go to extreme lengths and pay larger and larger sums of money simply to feel like they were part of a group. But only Sylvester McMonkey McBean, the man whose machine puts stars upon thus, profited from the Sneetch's desire to fit in. As with so many things, Dr. Seuss explained it best. The Sneetch's perfectly capture a very basic human need, the need to belong. Our need to belong is not rational, but it is a constant that exists across all people in all cultures. It is a feeling we get when those around us share our values and beliefs. When we feel like we belong we feel connected and we feel safe. As humans we crave the feeling and we seek it out. Sometimes our feeling of belonging is incidental. We're not friends with everyone from our hometown, but travel across the state, and you may meet someone from your hometown and you instantly have a connection with them. We're not friends with everyone from our home state, but travel across the country, and you'll feel a special bond with someone you meet who is from your home state. Go abroad and you'll form instant bonds with other Americans you meet. I remember a trip I took to Australia. One day I was on a bus and heard an American accent. I turned and struck up a conversation. I immediately felt connected to them, we could speak the same language, understand the same slang. As a stranger in a strange city, for that brief moment, I felt like I belonged, and because of it, I trusted those strangers on the bus more than any other passengers. In fact, we spent time together later. No matter where we go, we trust those with whom we are able to perceive common values or beliefs. This is not opinion, 
This is biology our desire to feel like we belong is so powerful that we will go to great lengths, do irrational things and often spend money to get that feeling. Like the Sneetches, we want to be around people and organizations who are like us and share our beliefs. When companies talk about what they do and how advanced their products are, they may have appeal, but they do not necessarily represent something to which we want to belong. But when a company clearly communicates their why, what they believe, and we believe what they believe, then we will sometimes go to extraordinary lengths to include those products or brands in our lives. This is not because they are better, but because they become markers or symbols of the values and beliefs we hold dear. Those products and brands make us feel like we belong and we feel a kinship with others who buy the same things. Fan clubs, started by customers, are often formed without any help from the company itself. These people form communities, in person or online, not just to share their love of a product with others but to be in the company of people like them. Their decisions have nothing to do with the company or its products, they have everything to do with the individuals themselves. Our natural need to belong also makes us good at spotting things that don't belong. It's a sense we get. A feeling. Something deep inside us, something we can't put into words, allows us to feel how some things just fit and some things just don't. Dell selling MP3 players just doesn't feel right because Dell defines itself as a computer company, so the only things that belong are computers. Apple defines itself as a company on a mission and so anything they do that fits that definition feels like it belongs. In 2004, they produced a promotional iPod in partnership with the iconoclastic Irish rock band U2. That makes sense. They would never have produced a promotional iPod with Celine Dion, even though she's sold vastly more records than U2 and may have a bigger audience. And Apple belong together because they share the same values and beliefs. They both push boundaries. It would not have made sense if Apple released a special iPod with Celine Dion. As big as her audience may be, the partnership just doesn't align. Look no farther than Apple's TV commercials I'm a Mac and I'm a PC for a perfect representation of who a Mac user needs to be to feel like they belong. In the commercial, the Mac user is a young guy, always in jeans and a t-shirt, always relaxed and always having a sense of humor poking fun at the system. The PC, as defined by Apple, is in a suit. Oldest dodgy. To fit in with Mac, you have to be like Mac. Microsoft responded to Apple with its own I'm a PC campaign, which depicts people from all walks of life identifying themselves as PC. Microsoft included many more people in their ads, teachers, scientists, musicians and children. As one would expect from the company that supplies 95% of the computer operating systems, to belong to that crowd, you have to be everyone else. One is not better or worse, it depends on where you feel like you belong. Are you a rabble rouser or are you with the majority? We are drawn to leaders and organizations that are good at communicating what they believe. Their ability to make us feel like we belong, to make us feel special, safe and not alone is part of what gives them the ability to inspire us. Those whom we consider great leaders all have an ability to draw us close and to command our loyalty. And we feel a strong bond with those who are also drawn to the same leaders and organizations. Apple users feel a bond with each other. Harley riders are bonded to each other. Anyone who was drawn to hear Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. give his I have a dream speech, regardless of race, religion or sex, stood together in that crowd as brothers and sisters, bonded by their shared values and beliefs. They knew they belonged together because they could feel it in their gut. 60. This is not opinion, this is biology gut decisions don't happen in your stomach the principles of the golden circle are much more than a communications hierarchy. Its principles are deeply grounded in the evolution of human behavior. The power of why is not opinion, it's biology. If you look at a cross section of the human brain, from the top down, you see that the levels of the golden circle correspond precisely with the three major levels of the brain. 
The newest area of the brain, our homo sapien brain, is the neocortex, which corresponds with the what level. The neocortex is responsible for rational and analytical thought and language. The middle two sections comprise the limbic brain. The limbic brain is responsible for all of our feelings, such as trust and loyalty. It is also responsible for all human behavior and all our decision making, but it has no capacity for language. When we communicate from the outside in, when we communicate what we do first, yes, people can understand vast amounts of complicated information, like facts and features, but it does not drive behavior. But when we communicate from the inside out, we're talking directly to the part of the brain that controls decision making, and our language part of the brain allows us to rationalize those decisions. The part of the brain that controls our feelings has no capacity for language. It is this disconnection that makes putting our feelings into words so hard. We have trouble, for example, explaining why we married the person we married. We struggle to put into words the real reasons why we love them, so we talk around it or rationalize it. She's funny, she's smart, we start. But there are lots of funny and smart people in the world but we don't love them and we don't want to marry them. There is obviously more to falling in love than just personality and competence. Rationally, we know our explanation isn't the real reason. It is how our loved ones make us feel, but those feelings are really hard to put into words. So when pushed, we start to talk around it. We may even say things that don't make any rational sense. She completes me, we might say, for example. What does that mean and how do you look for someone who does that so you can marry them? That's the problem with love, we only know when we've found it because it just feels right. The same is true for other decisions. When a decision feels right, we have a hard time explaining why we did what we did. Again, the part of the brain that controls decision making doesn't control language, so we rationalize. This complicates the value of polls or market research. Asking people why they chose you over another may provide wonderful evidence of how they have rationalized the decision, but it does not shed much light on the true motivation for the decision. It's not that people don't know, it's that they have trouble explaining why they do what they do. Decision making and the ability to explain those decisions exist in different parts of the brain. This is where gut decisions come from they just feel right. There is no part of the stomach that controls decision making, this is biology happens in the limbic brain. It's not an accident that we use that word feel to explain those decisions either. The reason gut decisions feel right is because the part of the brain that controls them also controls our feelings. Whether you defer to your gut or you're simply following your heart, no matter which part of the body you think is driving the decision, the reality is it's all in your limbic brain. Our limbic brain is powerful, powerful enough to drive behavior that sometimes contradicts our rational and analytical understanding of a situation. We often trust our gut even if the decision flies in the face of all the facts and figures. Richard Restack, a well-known neuroscientist, talks about this in his book The Naked Brain. When you force people to make decisions with only the rational part of their brain, they almost invariably end up overthinking. These rational decisions tend to take longer to make, says Restack, and can often be of lower quality. In contrast, decisions made with the limbic brain, gut decisions, tend to be faster, higher quality decisions. This is one of the primary reasons why teachers tell students to go with their first instinct when taking a multiple choice test, to trust their gut. The more time spent thinking about the answer, the bigger the risk that it may be the wrong one. Our limbic brains are smart and often know the right thing to do. It is our inability to verbalize the reasons that may cause us to doubt ourselves or trust the empirical evidence when our gut tells us not to. Empir Consider the experience of buying a flat screen TV at your local electronics store. You stand in the aisle listening to an expert explain to you the difference between LCD and plasma. The sales rep gives you all the rational differences and benefits, yet you are still none the wiser as to which one is best for you. 
After an hour, you still have no clue. Your mind is on overload because you're overthinking the decision. You eventually make a choice and walk out of the store, still not 100% convinced you chose the right one. Then you go to your friend's house and see that he bought the other one. He goes on and on about how much he loves his TV. Suddenly you're jealous, even though you still don't know that his is any better than yours. You wonder, did I buy the wrong one? Companies that fail to communicate a sense of why force us to make decisions with only empirical evidence. This is why those decisions take more time, feel difficult or leave us uncertain. Under these conditions manipulative strategies that exploit our desires, fears, doubts or fantasies work very well. We're forced to make these less than inspiring decisions for one simple reason, companies don't offer us anything else besides the facts and figures, features and benefits upon which to base our decisions. Companies don't tell us why. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. A failure to communicate why creates nothing but stress or doubt. In contrast, many people who are drawn to buy Macintosh computers or Harley Davidson motorcycles, for example, don't need to talk to anyone about which brand to choose. They feel the utmost confidence in their decision and the only question they ask is which Mac or which Harley. At that level, the rational features and benefits, facts and figures absolutely matter, but not to drive the decision to give money or loyalty to the company or brand. That decision is already made. The tangible features are simply to help direct the choice of product that best fits our needs. In these cases, the decisions happened in the perfect inside-out order. Those decisions started with why, the emotional component of the decision, and then the rational components allowed the buyer to verbalize or rationalize the reasons for their decision. This is what we mean when we talk about winning hearts and minds. The heart represents the limbic, feeling part of the brain, and the mind is the rational, language center. Most companies are quite adept at winning minds, all that requires is a comparison of all the features and benefits. Winning hearts, however, takes more work. Hearts, given the evidence of the natural order of decision making, I can't help but wonder if the order of the expression hearts and minds is a coincidence. Why does no one set out to win minds and hearts? The ability to win hearts before minds is not easy. It's a delicate balance of art and science, another coincidental grammatical construction. Why is it that things are not a balance of science and art, but always art before science? Perhaps it is a subtle clue our language impaired limbic brain is sending us to help us see that the art of leading is about following your heart. Perhaps our brains are trying to tell us that why must come first. Absente why, a decision is harder to make. And when in doubt we look to science, to data, to guide decisions. Companies will tell you that the reason they start with what they do or how they do it is because that's what their customers asked for. Quality. Service. Price. Features. That's what the data reported. But for the fact that the part of the brain that controls decision making is different from the part of the brain that is able to report back that decision, it would be a perfectly valid conclusion to give people what they ask for. Unfortunately, there is more evidence that sales don't significantly increase and bonds of loyalty are not formed simply when companies say or do everything their customers want. Henry Ford summed it up, best. If I had asked people what they wanted, he said, they would have said a faster horse. This is the genius of great leadership. Great leaders and great organizations are good at seeing what most of us can't see. They are good at giving us things we would never think of asking for. When the computer evolution was afoot, computer users couldn't ask for a graphical user interface. But that's what Apple gave us. In the face of expanding competition in the airline industry, most air travelers would never have thought to ask for less instead of more. But that's 65. Start with why what Southwest did. And in the face of hard times and overwhelming odds, few would have asked their country, what can I do for you over what can you do for me? The very cause upon which John F. Kennedy introduced his presidency. Great leaders are those who trust their gut.
They are those who understand the art before the science. They win hearts before minds. They are the ones who start with why. We make decisions all day long, and many of them are emotionally driven. Rarely do we sift through all the available information to ensure we know every fact. And we don't need to. It is all about degrees of certainty. I can make a decision with 30% of the information, said former Secretary of State Colin Powell. Anything more than 80% is too much. There is always a level at which we trust ourselves or those around us to guide us, and don't always feel we need all the facts and figures. And sometimes we just may not trust ourselves to make a certain decision yet. This may explain why we feel, there's that word again, so uncomfortable when others twist our arm to make a decision that doesn't sit well in our gut. We trust our gut to help us decide whom to vote for or which shampoo to buy. Because our biology complicates our ability to verbalize the real reasons why we make the decisions we do, we rationalize based on more tangible factors, like the design or the service or the brand. This is the basis for the false assumption that price or features matter more than they do. Those things matter, they provide us the tangible things we can point to to rationalize our decision making, but they don't set the course and they don't inspire behavior. It's what you can't see that matters gets your whites whiter and your brights brighter, said the TV commercial for the newest laundry detergent. This was the value proposition for so many years in the laundry detergent business. A perfectly legitimate claim. That's what the market research revealed customers wanted. The data was true, but the truth of what people wanted was different. The makers of laundry detergent asked consumers what they wanted from detergent, and consumers said whiter whites and brighter brights. Not such a remarkable finding, if you think about it, that people doing laundry wanted their detergent to help get their clothes not just clean, but very clean. So brands attempted to differentiate how they got your whites whiter and brights brighter by trying to convince consumers that one additive was more effective than another. Protein, said one brand. Color enhancers, said another. No one asked customers why they wanted their clothes clean. That little nugget wasn't revealed until many years later when a group of anthropologists hired by one of the packaged goods companies revealed that all those additives weren't in fact driving behavior. They observed that when people took their washing out of the dryer, no one held it up to the light to see how white it was or compared it to newer items to see how bright it was. The first thing people did when they pulled their laundry out of the dryer was to smell it. This was an amazing discovery. Feeling clean was more important to people than being clean. There was a presumption that all detergents get your clothes clean. That's what detergent is supposed to do. But having their clothes smell fresh and clean mattered much more than the nuanced differences between which detergent actually made clothes measurably cleaner. That a false assumption swayed an entire industry to follow the wrong direction is not unique to detergents. Cell phone companies believed people wanted more options and buttons until Apple introduced its iPhone with fewer options and only one button. The German automakers believed their engineering alone mattered to American car buyers. They were stunned and perplexed when they learned that great engineering wasn't enough. One by one, the German luxury car makers begrudgingly added cup holders to their fine automobiles. It was a feature that mattered a great deal to commuter minded Americans, but was rarely mentioned in any research about what factors influenced purchase decisions. I am not, for a moment, proposing that cup holders make people loyal to BMWs. All I am proposing is that even for rationally minded car buyers, there is more to decision making than meets the eye. Literally. The power of the limbic brain is astounding. It not only controls our gut decisions, but it can influence us to do things that seem illogical or irrational. Leaving the safety of home to explore far away places. Crossing oceans to see what's on the other side. Leaving a stable job to start a business out of your basement with no money in the bank. Many of us look at these decisions and say, that's stupid, you're crazy. You could lose everything. You could get yourself killed. 
What are you thinking? It is not logic or facts but our hopes and dreams, our hearts and our guts, that drive us to try new things. If we were all rational, there would be no small businesses, there would be no exploration, there would be very little innovation and there would be no great leaders to inspire all those things. It is the undying belief in something bigger and better that drives that kind of behavior. But it can also control behavior born out of other emotions, like hate or fear. Why else would someone plot to hurt someone they had never met? The amount of market research that reveals that people want to do business with the company that offers them the best quality products, with the most features, the best service and all at a good price is astounding. But consider the companies with the greatest loyalty, they rarely have all those things. If you wanted to buy a custom Harley Davidson, you used to wait six months for delivery, to give them credit, they've got it down from a year. That's bad service. Apple's computers are at least 25% more expensive than a comparable PC. There is less software available for their operating system. They have fewer peripherals. The machines themselves are sometimes slower than a comparable PC. If people made only rational decisions, and did all the research before making a purchase, no one would ever buy a Mac. But of course people do buy Macs. And some don't just buy them, they love them, a feeling that comes straight from the heart. Or the limbic brain. We all know someone who is a die-hard Mac lover. Ask them why they love their Mac. They won't tell you, well, I see myself as someone who likes to challenge the status quo, and it's important for me to surround myself with the people, products and brands that prove to the outside world who I believe I am. Biologically, that's what happened. But that decision was made in the part of the brain that controls behavior but not language. So they will provide a rationalization, it's the user interface. It's the simplicity. It's the design. It's the high quality. They're the best computers. I'm a creative person. In reality, their purchase decision and their loyalty are deeply personal. They don't really care about Apple, it's all about them. The same can even be said for the people who love to work at Apple. Even employees can't put it into words. In their case, their job is one of the what's to their why. They too are convinced it's the quality of the products alone that is behind Apple's success. But deep inside, they all love being a part of something bigger than themselves. The most loyal Apple employees, like the most loyal Apple customers, all love a good revolution. A great raise and added benefits couldn't convince a loyal Apple employee to work for Dell, and no amount of cashback incentives and rebates could convince a loyal Mac user to switch to a PC, many are already paying double the price. This is beyond rational. This is a belief. It's no accident that the culture at Apple is often described as a cult. It's more than just products, it's a cause to support. It's a matter of faith. Remember the Honda and the Ferrari? Products are not just symbols of what the company believes, they also serve as symbols of what the loyal buyers believe. People with Apple laptop computers, for example, love opening them up while sitting in an airport. They like that everyone knows they are using a Mac. It's an emblem, a symbol of who they are. That glowing Apple logo speaks to something about them and how they see the world. Does anyone notice when someone pops open the lid of their HP or Dell computer? No. Not even the people using the computers care. HP and Dell have a fuzzy sense of why, so their products and their brands don't symbolize anything about the users. To the Dell or HP user, their computer, no matter how fast or sleek, is not a symbol of a higher purpose, cause or belief. It's just a computer. In fact, for the longest time, the logo on the lid of a Dell computer faced the user so when they opened it, it would be upside down for everyone else. Products with a clear sense of why give people a way to tell the outside world who they are and what they believe. Remember, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. If a company does not have a clear sense of why then it is impossible for the outside world to perceive anything more than what the company does. And when that happens, manipulations that rely on pushing price, 
features, service or quality become the primary currency of differentiation. Clarity, discipline and consistency nature abhors a vacuum. In order to promote life, Mother Nature attempts to find balance whenever possible. When life is destroyed because of a forest fire, for example, nature will introduce new life to replace it. The existence of a food chain in any ecosystem, in which each animal exists as food for another, is a way of maintaining balance. The golden circle, grounded in natural principles of biology, obeys the need for balance as well. As I've discussed, when the why is absent, imbalance is produced and manipulations thrive. And when manipulations thrive, uncertainty increases for buyers, instability increases for sellers and stress increases for all. Starting with why is just the beginning. There is still work to be done before a person or an organization earns the right or ability to inspire. For the golden circle to work, each of the pieces must be in balance and in the right order. Clarity of why it all starts with clarity. You have to know why you do what you do. If people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it, so it follows that if you don't know why you do what you do, how will anyone else? If the leader of the organization can't clearly articulate why the organization exists in terms beyond its products or services, then how does he expect the employees to know why to come to work? If a politician can't articulate why she seeks public office beyond the standard to serve the people, the minimum rational standard for all politicians, then how will the voters know whom to follow? Manipulations can motivate the outcome of an election, but they don't help choose who should lead. To lead requires those who willingly follow. It requires those who believe in something bigger than a single issue. To inspire starts with the clarity of why. Discipline of how once you know why you do what you do, the question is how will you do it? How's are your values or principles that guide how to bring your cause to life? How we do things manifests in the systems and processes within an organization and the culture. Understanding how you do things and, more importantly, having the discipline to hold the organization and all its employees accountable to those guiding principles enhances an organization's ability to work to its natural strengths. Understanding how gives greater ability, for example, to hire people or find partners who will naturally thrive when working with you. Ironically, the most important question with the most elusive answer, why do you do what you do, is actually quite simple and efficient to discover, and I'll share it in later chapters. It's the discipline to never veer from your cause, to hold yourself accountable to how you do things, that's the hardest part. Making it even more difficult for ourselves, we remind ourselves of our values by writing them on the wall. As nouns. Integrity. Honesty. Innovation. Communication, for example. But nouns are not actionable. They are things. You can't build systems or develop incentives around those things. It's nearly impossible to hold people accountable to nouns. A little more innovation today if you would please, Bob. And if you have to write honesty on your wall to remind you to do it, then you probably have bigger problems anyway. For values or guiding principles to be truly effective they have to be verbs. It's not integrity, it's always do the right thing. It's not innovation, it's look at the problem from a different angle. Articulating our values as verbs gives us a clear idea. We have a clear idea of how to act in any situation. We can hold each other accountable to them measure them or even build incentives around them. Telling people to have integrity doesn't guarantee that their decisions will always keep customers or clients best interest in mind, telling them to always do the right thing does. I wonder what values Samsung had written on the wall when they developed that rebate that wasn't applicable to people living in apartment buildings. The golden circle offers an explanation for long-term success. But the inherent nature of doing things for the long term often includes investments or short term costs. This is the reason the discipline to stay focused on the why and remain true to your values matters so much. Consistency of what everything you say and everything you do has to prove what you believe. A why is just a belief. That's all it is. 
How's are the actions you take to realize that belief? And what's are the results of those actions, everything you say and do, your products, services, marketing, PR, culture and whom you hire? If people don't buy what you do but why you do it, then all these things must be consistent. With consistency people will see and hear, without a shadow of a doubt, what you believe. After all, we live in a tangible world. After the only way people will know what you believe is by the things you say and do, and if you're not consistent in the things you say and do, no one will know what you believe. It is at the what level that authenticity happens. Authenticity is that word so often bandied about in the corporate and political worlds. Everyone talks about the importance of being authentic. You must be authentic, experts say. All the trend data shows that people prefer to do business with authentic brands. People vote for the authentic candidate. The problem is, that instruction is totally unactionable. How do you go into somebody's office and say, from now on, please, a little more authenticity? That marketing piece you're working on, a CEO might instruct, please make it a little more authentic. What do companies do to make their marketing or their sales or whatever they're doing authentic? The common solution is hilarious to me. They go out and do customer research and they ask the customers, what would we have to tell you for us to be authentic? This entirely misses the point. You can't ask others what you have to do to be authentic. Being authentic means that you already know. What does a politician say when told to be more authentic? How does a leader act more authentically? Without a clear understanding of why, the instruction is completely useless. What authenticity means is that your golden circle is in balance. It means that everything you say and everything you do you actually believe. This goes for management as well as the employees. Only when that happens can the things you say and do be viewed as authentic. Apple believed that its original Apple computer and its Macintosh challenged the dominant IBM DOS platforms. Apple believes its iPod and iTunes products are challenging the status quo in the music industry. And we all understand why Apple does what it does. It is because of that mutual understanding that we view those Apple products as authentic. Dell introduced MP3 players and PTAs in an attempt to enter the small electronics business. We don't know what else why is, we have no certainty about what the company believes or why it produced those products beyond self-gain and a desire to capitalize on a new market segment. Those products are not authentic. It's not that Dell couldn't enter other markets, it certainly has the knowledge and ability to make good products, but its ability to do so without a clear understanding of why is what makes it much harder and much more expensive. Just producing high quality products and marketing them does not guarantee success. Authenticity cannot be achieved without clarity of why. And authenticity matters. Ask the best salesman what it takes to be a great salesman. They will always tell you that it helps when you really believe in the product you're selling. What does belief have to do with a sales job? Simple. When salesmen actually believe in the thing they are selling, then the words that come out of their mouths are authentic. When belief enters the equation, passion exudes from the salesman. It is this authenticity that produces the relationships upon which all the best sales organizations are based. Relationships also build trust. And with trust comes loyalty. Absent a balanced golden circle means no authenticity, which means no strong relationships, which means no trust. And you're back at square one selling on price, service, quality or features. You are back to being like everyone else. Worse, without that authenticity, companies resort to manipulation, pricing, promotions, peer pressure, fear, take your pick. Effective? Of course, but only for the short term. Being authentic is not a requirement for success, but it is if you want that success to be a lasting success. Again, it goes back to why. Authenticity is when you say and do the things you actually believe. But if you don't know why the organization or the products exist on a level beyond what you do, 
then it is impossible to know if the things you say or do are consistent with 75. Start with why your why. Without why, any attempt at authenticity will almost always be inauthentic. The right order after you have clarity of why, are disciplined and accountable to your own values and guiding principles, and are consistent in all you say and do, the final step is to keep it all in the right order. Just like that little Apple marketing example I used earlier, simply changing the order of the information, starting with why, changed the impact of the message. The what's are important, they provide the tangible proof of the why, but why must come first. The why provides the context for everything else. As you will see over and over in all the cases and examples in this book, whether in leadership, decision making or communication, starting with why has a profound and long lasting impact on the result. Starting with why is what inspires people to act. If you don't know why,